College Football Nerds here talking Ohio State and Georgia. Playoff matchup, super interesting game, kind of hard to pick. Josh is going to help me get nerdy with y'all. i got two things that I want to give you for homework. Obviously, you got to give us your score prediction in the comments. You know, And if you haven't liked, subscribe, subscribe by now, you need to go ahead and do that because that's embarrassing at this point. But the other thing that I want y'all to weigh in on is we got one more live show in us this year. One more in the tank, and we're trying to figure out when we want to do it. Um, do we want to do it Sunday after the first round of the playoffs, before the Rose Bowl? Do we want to do it after the Rose Bowl? Or do we want to wait until after the National Championship game and do it then as kind of a season wrap-up? We're feeling Sunday a little bit because we lack the idea of having some results but still some things to anticipate. But we're going to listen to the crowd. We're going to crowdsource this and let, let you all weigh in. So, all right, Josh, um, this game is interesting to me because – you know, we missed our pick on Ohio State, Michigan, but we only missed it for explosive plays. If Ohio State doesn't give up those bombs, um, doesn't give up the long runs, like they win that game. And we did say, like, like you can't discount those big plays because that is part of Michigan's DNA. So it's not entirely fair. But Ohio State facing Georgia has a much different task in terms of how they defend Georgia or how Georgia goes about getting their points. And in a lot of ways, I think it's a lot harder um, to defend an offense that's a giant efficiency monster. So why don't you break that down a little bit in terms of kind of how this is different, how Michigan gets their points versus how Georgia's going to attack this Ohio State defense. And let's let that be our opening salvo in this one. It is interesting because I think a lot of people would just assume that Georgia and Michigan are very similar offensive teams, and in a lot of ways they somewhat are. Um, but the way Georgia operates is actually probably a lot more, a lot more spread in certain ways. They're a lot more likely to throw on second and third down, um, and they they just operate in an insane efficiency clip. Uh, I mean, they they turn first downs like nobody's business uh, from. Points drive per score or points scored per drive perspective, I should say. I mean, they're six in the country. They average 3.6 points per drive scored. It's actually 3.64. And just to make it clear, Ohio State's at 3.70. So when you look at the scoring and offensive metrics, it's basically just down to tempo, the difference between Ohio State and Georgia. And yeah, Ohio State may have more yards, but it's just because they run more plays. Uh, Georgia, from a drive to drive perspective, is almost exactly as likely to score. And from an offensive efficiency perspective, Georgia's fourth in the country in FEI offensive ratings, which is a mostly offensive-based metric. The only teams ahead of them would be Tennessee, USC, and Ohio State. Uh, Michigan, for comparison, is ninth. And I'll see the gap between Georgia and Michigan in this largely efficiency-based metric is a 1.72 rating to a 1.38 rating. Uh, that's 0.34. That's about the same gap as Michigan down to, for example, Texas or Kansas State. Um, it, it's it's a kind of a monster. There's a reason they're the number one team in the country. Everything that everybody else does well offensively, they do very well. But I will say they don't have the same sort of explosive game that I think Michigan has. I mean, they do have some explosive plays downfield, um, but they get them in different ways. I mean, they get their explosives usually in big chunks, but not necessarily 70-yard scores on a consistent basis. Um what they're more li really more about is just having a lot of different weapons. They've got guys at receiver, at tight end, at running back, all of which that can make big plays, all of which that can make consistent plays, and they spread you out and they just attack, 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 wherever they feel like they have the best matchup, and they tend to march down the field on you and score a lot of points doing so. And hey guys, I want to take a quick break here to talk about our sponsor for 2022, and that's Bird Dogs. They've been with us all year, and you guys like to support us. We don't ask a lot from you. Support our sponsor. And this year we're pretty proud to sponsor them because Bird Dogs makes wonderful products. Here you got the shorts, you're sitting around the fire, drinking some eggnog, trying to show off your nice calves like a 17th century Englishman. And you can wear these wonderful shorts with great liners. You got pockets, form fitting cut to show off your booty and hey if you're like me and maybe your legs are pale and you know what it's a little too cold to wear shorts they make joggers and pants too so check out bird dogs wonderful products cheaper than the lululemon but just as good a quality and you know what if you go to birddogs.com enter promo code nerds and they'll throw in a free bird dogs rope hat that's 
BirdDogs.com, promo code NERDS, and boom, a free Bird Dogs rope hat with your pair of Bird Dogs. The most comfortable shorts, pants, and sweatpants with built-in liners. You will not take these things off, I promise you. So. Yeah, and, and everyone's going to want to, you know, whistle past the graveyard a little bit and say, well, look, Georgia gave up 30 points to LSU, and LSU for, threw for 500 yards against them. Kirby Smart comes from the same Saban point of view in that just win the game. When you have nothing to play for, just win the game. That's why a lot of these Alabama-Notre Dame games in the playoffs um, and, and last year against Cincinnati, they were kind of you know ugly, ho-hum wins. Um, Georgia was playing prevent the entire second half. And the flip side of this is if you're going to say, oh, well, Georgia's defense is suspect because they gave up 30 points to LSU – and 500 yards passing, the flip side of that is two things. One, LSU ran for 2.4 yards per attempt, per carry. And two, this Georgia team also comfortably and easily scored 50 points against LSU. And yeah, one touchdown was just complete, you know, tomfoolery with the with the field goal block. But 50 points, and, and they could have scored 70 if they wanted. So that's the other thing you have to contend with. But I will say this in Ohio State's favor. On the flip side of all this, Georgia hasn't faced a lot of good passing attacks. They've faced really one in in Tennessee. And they they did very well in that game. But there is an opportunity, especially after a long layoff. I always go back to 2017 Rose Bowl. Georgia was shocked in that first half against Baker Mayfield. And then they adjusted, but it was almost too late when they adjusted. Ohio State has the type of elite weapons and the type of offense that could shock a Georgia. I don't care how elite their defense is. Ohio State, if they're clicking in the first half and Georgia comes out a little sleepy, they could look up and be, you know, down 21-10 pretty early. Like, that is definitely a thing that could happen. So talk a little bit about how, you know, Ohio State goes about getting their points versus the one good offense that... uh, good passing offense that Georgia's faced this year? I think Ohio State brings some things to the table offensively that are unique for anybody in college football to deal with. I mean, the the depth of the wide receiving core is sort of a unique thing. They've got three or four guys that they put out in a given time, all of which can be high-level weapons. You know, we've been high on Marvison Harrison Jr. since the beginning of the season, but you guys got like Ed Buko all the way down to guys like Julian Fleming – as backups that are all very talented players. And that means you've got to really defend the whole width of the field. I think that can strain defenses in ways they're not used to. Um, I think C.J. Stroud has been operating in a very high level personally. I think to a large extent, I think Stroud has looked worse by virtue of what everyone around him is doing in a way that maybe Bryce Young is sort of sort of the opposite at times. Like I, I, I see Stroud throwing into very tight windows I made a comment at one time on Twitter, which no one took right, which, you know, that's Twitter, that a C.J. Stroud window is like 10 times the size of a Bryce Young window. And what I meant by that is Stroud will throw the ball in very, very tight spaces and try to get them completed even when guys are in close coverage. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But he can afford to do that because he's a very accurate passer. You know, Alabama with Bryce Young, even last year in the SEC title game, he's a guy that runs around and creates and they've got these big explosive weapons and they're all about getting guys really open. Um, and it's a very different thing to defend Tennessee, who's the, sort of the same mindset, split guys out wide, stack release, trying to fight that man coverage concept where now you can't really get you know get hands on a wide receiver and get them downfield. They're either going to be wide open for a touchdown or they're not going to complete the pass. Ohio State is going to make you contest every throw, and they're going to do it in intermediate yardage, and they're going to really strain your ability to play the ball in those situations. And it's just a different type of football. I'm not saying Georgia can't do it. I'm saying it's a different style of passing game, and I'm not sure that anyone Georgia played really is able to do that at a high level. Uh, And so it's a different question. The other thing I will say with Georgia defensively, uh, something I think really probably hasn't gotten quite enough play, is that Nolan Smith is still Georgia's sack leader on the season, even though he only played eight games. And behind him has been Jalen Carter, who I think, you know, now that he's really fully healthy in the rotation, I think is an absolute monster. But Carter and Dumas Johnson being the next guys up um, isn't ideal. I I think they've got some guys like Mikel Williams, the freshman, that have come on, and Bullard that have shown the ability to rush the passer some. 
but this is not a great pass rushing team. Nolan Smith himself wasn't necessarily a phenomenal pass rusher. He was a good one, um, but he wasn't, you know, wasn't like an any of the Andersons from Georgia or Alabama in recent years. Uh, and I think that maybe hurts them a little more, too, with Stroud, because I think Ohio State has the most problems when you're able to get pressure. So there are some opportunities there. You know, maybe there are some weaknesses there that haven't necessarily been exposed. I think this is a very good Georgia defense, and so we're definitely nitpicking and grasping at straws. But when you're playing elite teams and elite offenses, those are the sorts of distinctions you got to get into. Yeah, and one of the things that I don't think people really paid attention to in the Michigan game for Ohio State is – Yes, that game got away from them late. Michigan scored 21 points in the fourth quarter, and Michigan scored their their 17 in the first half with a couple of bombs where the you know the the coverage broke down. But Ohio State had 20 points in the first half, and it was interesting to me to note that Stroud had time to throw. That Ohio State offensive line held their own against a very good Michigan defense. Um, and that was different from the game last year. 2021 Ohio State Michigan, CJ Stroud was running for his life and and he still had some production and they but they lost, you know, in, in terms of points in a similar fashion. This year was a lot different in that he had time to throw. Now, Michigan's pass defense was good. He had to throw in tight windows, you're right, but he had time to throw. And if he can have time to throw against Georgia, you know, that potential to shock that Georgia defense might come into play. Um, I I hate that we're not going to see a healthy running back room for Ohio State, but on the flip side, Josh, and and this maybe gets you into the model, but I'd like for you to touch on it a little bit before you do. Kendall Milton's a really underrated running back, and I think he's ever bit – I think this Georgia running game is ever bit as good as anything – that Michigan's going to roll out there. I think that there's, you know, Stetson Bennett's escapability and ability to run the ball is is better than J.J. McCarthy. So I think that for all of the, you know, thinking about Bowers in this tight end room and the efficient passing, one thing that I'm concerned if I'm a Ohio State fan is contending with Georgia's ability to continually get first, first downs from either quarterback escapability or Milton getting seven yards a touch. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges with Georgia and one of the reasons they are so efficient is that they've got a true multi-headed monster at running back, McIntosh, Edwards, and Milton. Uh, Milton's actually the third leading uh, ball carrier for the team, but he has the highest average. It's uh, over seven yards per carry, which is pretty crazy, 72 carries. Um, But all those guys can run the ball. All of them can run at a high level. Um, they're all going to be NFL tailbacks at some level. Um, all going to be draft picks. Uh, and I think it's... I don't know that there's a first-round draft pick of the group. I'm not sure there's a first-round draft pick. There are not many first-round draft pick running backs, period. But I think people underestimate that, yeah, okay, just assume that they're third-round draft picks. A team that has three or four junior, senior, third-round draft pick backs is hard to stop. Combine it with a very good offensive line with a quarterback that, remember, uh, you know, he's an old guy, right? You know, you, you've got a quarterback in Stetson Bennett that's an old player, so he's very effect, effective and efficient. He knows the offense backwards and forwards. And you get something that's kind of, you know, kind of difficult to contend with. Um, and I think, I think that ability to lean on a team was something that really caused problems for Ohio State when they were playing Michigan. I don't know that they were... You know, they played in some tight games, but I thought it was a little different for them maybe to play a physical football team against a physical football game against a team that could keep it close late in the game and they were the one getting punched rather than ones delivering the punch. But to do that against a team like Georgia that has that kind of physicality and they combine it with a quarterback that, you know, no, Stetson Bennett is older than Justin Fields, which is kind of crazy to say, that sort of brings a whole other dimension, right? You know, the fact that Georgia, it's not just the running backs too, but the receive, the tight end room is crazy. Everybody talks about it with Brock Bowers or Darnell Washington. Um, what those guys do is it allows them to formationally, they can come out with two wide receivers and they can go four wide and have four re- real receiving threats, or they can bring it close and they can have seven guys in the line of scrimmage, make either side strong. They can run, they can throw, they can run, they can throw. And out of, you know, out of two tight end sets, 
you don't know what you're getting on a given play, so you can't rotate personnel, and it's hard to specialize. It's hard to deal with it, and it just grinds, and it grinds, and it grinds, and they'll march down the field. Um, you know, I said it earlier, right? Their offense is underrated. We talk about, you know, that FEI rating. Just to put a cap on it, 1.78 is the offensive rating for Ohio State. 1.72 is the rating for Georgia. <laughs> Michigan's, again, 1.38. So it's not like the gaps are usually that small. Uh, Georgia's just a very good offensive football team. And with that, I will take it to the model. Um, Georgia defensively, like we've seen with a lot of teams, they're not at the same numbers we're kind of used to seeing from elite defenses. They're still 70% of opponent rushing averages, 85% of opponent passing averages. But I would normally categorize that as merely very good against the run and merely good against the pass. Um, it seems like, I don't know, maybe offensive football is down, maybe defense across the board is up. And remember, these numbers are all relational, right? So if everybody's playing better, then your numbers are going to look a little worse because you're, you're not distinguishing yourself as much from the other really good teams in your conference. Um, Ohio State defensively is even more maybe a victim of this phenomenon that we talked about with Michigan and others. Um, 89% against the run and 100% against the pass. That is a pretty average run defense, and it is a mediocre to poor pass defense. Um and so even though Ohio State has advantages offensively, and I'll say they're uh, about the same when it comes to rushing offense, Ohio State is a little bit better right, passing the ball, unsurprisingly. Georgia's advantages defensively make up for that. And so our model has this about a yard per play advantage for Georgia, 6.9 yards per play to 5.9 for Ohio State. That is a 31 to 26 point uh, differential with Georgia being favored by five. Uh, again, this is a game where Georgia's favored in real life by six and a half. Um, so maybe point and a half SEC edge, just like we were talking about, the Big 12 was getting maybe two to three point, um, ding two to three points uh, due to their, uh, their general perceived quality of play. But it's right in line with the power rankings, uh, ra ratings, where this point spread is. Um, and I will also note um, you know, our model has this game 57 points, the over-unders at 62, so it's really all across the board consistent, uh, and it really just comes down to the fact that, you know, Georgia is a better defensive football team, they're not that much worse on offense, that's enough to give them an edge. In a game where both teams are expected to be in the functional scoring, you know, we're, we're both over 25 points, this isn't expected to be a defensive struggle, this is supposed to be a classic Classic football game in normal football scoring where Georgia's just a little bit better than Ohio State. So, Josh, this is where I make Ohio State fans upset. And I, I want to preface this because they're going to call us SEC homers. We do a lot better in numbers, actually, with Ohio State than we do Georgia. Like, it just, it's a weird quirk. Even though we have an SEC footprint and that's how we got started, we do a lot more numbers. Um, so, it would be great for us to just always pick Ohio State and kiss, kiss their butt. But, I think this game is going to be a struggle for Ohio State because they have yet to face a truly efficient and dynamic offense like Georgia. I think Ohio State's going to get some points. Um, I don't think Georgia's defense is as good as it has been in the past. Um, but I've got Georgia 41, Ohio State 27, and that's a good bit more than, than what Vegas is, is given this game. I think the matchup's bad. I will say this, Georgia has shown at times this year that they can play a little bit of knucklehead football. Uh, Missouri was one of those games. Um, obviously, they haven't had a lot of huge games to get up for, but those huge games that they had, they really got up for them. Um, I don't think this is as good of a Georgia team as last year. I don't think this is... Whoever wins a national championship will be as good as national champions in the past. But I also think that Georgia is potentially that much better than the field. So give me Georgia 41, Ohio State 27, and tell me what you got. I'm going to go with 41-34 um, Georgia. And the reason for that is, is pretty simple. I just think that they're a little bit different level than everyone else. I think their ability to score points is an underrated part, which we've harped on through this whole video, but for good reason. Uh, the other thing I'll say, though, is I think Georgia usually has a big advantage in the trenches. They've had the most physical or active front seven in recent years. 
Jalen Carter, I think, is quietly, easily one of the best players in the country, and I don't think he gets nearly as much hype as he should, sort of the nature of being a nose tackle, despite, again, being second on the team in sacks, which is crazy for a 300-plus pound nose guard. Um, but Ohio State, through this year, has shown the ability to score large amounts of points without a run game. They did it against Iowa. They had 2.2 yards per carry, put up 54 points. 3.77 yards per carry against Penn State, put up 44 points. 3.7 yards per carry against Maryland, put up 43 points. So I think there is a world here where this looks a lot like, you know, 2015, 20, particularly 2016 Clemson. Those were teams in the national title where they did not run the ball at all. And it didn't necessarily matter because their passing game was so good that they could operate without a run game. It is something you can do in the pros, and it is something you can do in college if you have an elite quarterback. I think Ohio State has an elite quarterback in C.J. Stroud that's operating at a very high level. I just think the problem is a lot like what we saw with Georgia and Michigan last year. Georgia's talent level and physicality is, even for Ohio State, a disadvantage. You know, they're outmatched. And Ohio State's offensive line and defensive line have been a lot more physical this year than last year. Georgia is a tier better than anyone Ohio State's played on both sides of the line. And Ohio State has struggled at times a little bit in both of those regards. I think it's going to be too much. And I think Ohio State is going to score. I think they're going to stay in this game. I think they have a chance and to win and may win this game. I'll say it seems like most of the money's on Georgia. That concerns me greatly. I seriously considered flipping my pick to Ohio State in this game due to the, again, the the, the ability to, to pass without the run and the fact that way too much money's on Georgia, I think. But I, I just, I don't think the public's wrong. I, I think the reality is that Georgia is probably a little bit of a different level. I think oh, this Ohio State team is very, very good, but I think they're beatable on both sides of the ball. And against a team that's going to have an entire month defensively to figure out Ohio State, going to take them seriously, and they're going to get Georgia's best shot, I, I think it's just too much. I, I think Ohio State is going to show that they belong, but they won't be able and to And I will win. say, we both picked Georgia by double digits last year against Michigan. I don't feel as confident about this, even though I'm picking Georgia by double digits. I don't feel as confident about this game as I did last year. Last year was a much different matchup scenario that I just didn't think Michigan matched up very well at all. This year is different. I've got Georgia big, but – or two touchdowns, and I wouldn't be shocked if Ohio State won. That's just kind of where I'm at. Um, all right, y'all, let us know in the comments what you think the score is going to be. Don't forget to let us know when you think we should do our last live show of the season. And as we always say, it helps us out a ton if you can share this where you talk football, either on the forums or Facebook or even Twitter. It helps us out a lot, and it helps us. We try to find you where you are. And, and discuss it with you. Uh, we got memberships on, on message boards. Obviously, we're on Twitter as well. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week. God bless.